cognitive load and emotional load registers the same on your autonomic nervous system as a sports athlete does. So we know how to measure it there. We're not measuring it in the workplace. And because of that, we're not taking into consideration the conditioning, the recovery, and all the things necessary on the stress. So the question we started asking is teachers that are going into the classroom with the cognitive load of dealing with 20 to 30 kids coming in at different emotional levels, trying to work in a constrained environment of performance and testing, and trying to deliver 30 unique individuals to the same outcome, testing outcome, uh, what's, what's the toll that it's taking on them? And uh, how many were part of Bill Latham's workshop? He's, he's a co-author in this research, okay. I don't know if he used this phrase, but this was something that hit him. In Luke, it says that when the student is fully formed, he will be like his master. So if we have stressed out, burned out, depressed, tired, fatigued teachers, and students will spend up to 14,000 hours with them over the, their career, what is that going to produce at the income? Because in the bottom line is we don't transmit what we know, we transmit who we are. And the science coming in on what's happening is amazing. I mean, in British Columbia, they did a, a saliva swab uh, test. Teachers that showed higher cortisol, guess what their students showed? Higher stress. You can measure the electromagnetic field of my heart, heart rate variability, and I'm not going to get really technical with this, but you can pick up that electromagnetic field up to four feet away. And they've had subjects with EEGs, electroencephalograms and electrocardiograms doing different, and the mind will mirror the heart wave going on. The heart's a powerful mechanism that we're just beginning to understand the relationship of the heart and the brain. So the object that we see here is broken pottery. It's a Japanese art form, and it was the inspiration for the new project that we're doing. The Japanese believe that this is a, it honors the human condition, that the beauty is not the pottery, but it's the lines that connect the broken pieces. That's the beauty. And this has more value than an unbroken pot, piece of pottery. It's part of their philosophy. We had a group of educators participate in the work we were doing on the corporate workplace. And when we got into the book barn raising session, which I'll share with you a little bit of that, they came up with this imagery on valuing the beauty of the broken piece of pottery. I'm a broken piece of pottery. I'm broken in my marriage relationship and it gets healed over and over again. I'm broken as a father, but it gets healed over and over again. I'm broken in the workplace, many wins, many failures, relationships, conflict, gets healed. The value I bring is not any brilliance, it's the healing intersections and the experience. It's, it's not the truth I bring, it's the redeemed truth that I represent. Truth that doesn't become crucified and rise again is seed on the ground that never rises. And the challenge we found in the workplace is that I cannot bring my whole self to work. When I come to the front door of the workplace or the school, I have to put my game face on and pretend that the rest of my life doesn't really interfere, and that's how people feel that if your life interferes, and we know there's boundaries in that. And so part of the challenge in the mental health quest that we've been on is that, number one, to even admit that it's not all that it appears to be on this smiling face and all of this <clears throat> is a stigma. So I want to walk you through this new research that we have. 
and a real revelation we hit. So we, we wrote the book, Humanizing the Education Machine. It was really about tackling two big wicked problems, the machine the Gutenberg, and the Gutenberg to Google divide. That was a lot of what it was about. And the machine we saw created disengagement. So I'm gonna play this opening. Uh, this is the first chapter of the book. It's a little promo to that. But then I'm gonna kind of take the record player. How many remember record players? <laughs> and the needle going across the record. Will you hear that? When we're done with this, I'm gonna do that to this beautiful piece of video work. So we open our story with a chapter called Numbers Don't Lie. Now these are not the standard numbers we see, the test scores that are flat and declining, the billions of dollars that seem to be wasted in school reform. This is a more important number. It's the engagement number. 70% of teachers would rather be anyplace else than in their classrooms teaching today. They're disengaged. But even worse, by 12th grade, only 40% of the kids even care about school anymore. That really gets to the heart of the issue. It really gets to the heart of what drove us to try to find out how do we rehumanize learning? How do we reconnect to the thing that engages us the most? Discovery, curiosity, and hope. Okay. Wasn't that brilliant? Who's that guy? Um, that's the opening chapter. How many have seen those numbers? 70% of teachers are disengaged. What if that was wrong? What if we were wrong? What if the problem isn't disengagement? That was hard to swallow. <clears throat> now, that's certainly a symptom of the problem, and a huge symptom. But we traced it to a new root source that was completely unexpected for us to find. And it is the key to the health and the well-being of your schools. So I want to take you through the journey we've gone through over the last five years because it started with the corporate journey. So I want you to be patient with me as I give you the context because that's an important part of how we go about the discovery process. Uh, we don't do research the typical way. I mean, we do all the meta-analysis meta and all of that, but it's really a collective effort of discovery and testing and, and challenging. So it all started here in 2013. This is where our research began. And it began with a book called Change Your Space, Change Your Culture. And in that book, we were dealing with corporate disengagement and how the, the design and construction world can really bring its thinking process to help companies uh, become, to help environment become a catalyst to new behaviors and new values and new attitudes. Winston Churchill famously said, after the bombing in the Blitzkrieg of, of the House of Commons, several of the people wanted to create a round. And Winston Churchill said that Part of the foundation of our parliamentary process is the debate, is the adversarial debate we have. And he said, we're going to have the square where we have two sides looking at each other, because that was the foundation of our democracy. And he said, we will build the buildings, but the buildings will shape us. And that's the important part of environment is that we don't realize that the environments we've created have already constrained certain activities or rewarded certain activities. We need to begin going back and looking because we've built these pillbox prison kind of environments of fixed walled classrooms and they serve the purpose and time but they don't fit the current world. It's highly fluid, changing, adaptable, uh, and we researched it here. That gentleman there is Lou Horn. He's the Southern Region President for CB Richard Ellis or CBRE. They're the world's largest corporate real estate brokerage firm and real estate management firm, about 120,000 employees. This was their headquarters. We profiled it in the book. 
They were the very first well-certified building. How many have heard of the International Well Building Institute and the International Well Building Standard? Not one hand. Our buildings are killing us, killing creativity, killing us. It's the first standard to incorporate what we know about health and well-being into the architecture and the environment. So we wrote about that in the book. Their office started ordering copy after copy. Now, when they became the very first, we didn't cover it because they were the first. I was on a book deadline. <clears throat> There's a paragraph on the International Well-Building Standard in the book, a paragraph. Lou orders, after 500 books, I call Lou Horn up and said, Lou, thank you very much. My family thanks you. But what is up? Why are you ordering case and case of books? He said, because of our wellness journey together. And this is an incredible journey. And we tell more of it in the new book, The Healthy Workplace Nudge. And so he's telling me about it, and I was interested. And then when he said this one word, or one sentence, I said, I got to go see. He said, we've had 14,000 visitors in the last 18 months to see our story, to hear our story, to see our facility for 250 people. Because it's so transformed the people in the office, the activity in the office, the productivity, this whole thing about wellness. And what the standard was essentially was a blueprint and a roadmap of how do we live and work healthier together. That's what it was. So they went on this journey, all this response, 14, 000, how would you like to have 14,000 people want to come to see your school to see what it is you're doing that's producing such healthy and happy folks and what roadmap you use to get there. It was transformational. So after I saw that, and I experienced it, and I said, oh my goodness, there is a story here to tell. And we didn't know whether this was lightning in a bottle, a one-off, or this was ground zero for a new conversation. So in 2015, I pulled together 10 of the top leaders in our industry in architecture construction. We had two lead designers from Google. We had the president of the largest architectural firm in the nation. We had the third largest construction firm there. We had CBRE to talk about the implications and, and ask, is there something happening here? We said, yes. So we launched on a mind shift effort into the wilderness. This was the final summit. It was at GoDaddy. We had 130 people in our research. We traveled to eight locations, and we go to positive outliers. That's another part of our research. People breaking the rules, getting better results. Two years of work. GoDaddy was our book barn raising. You'll see in the second row to the left, the young blonde, which is my wife, Irene, who is into architecture, Chelsea with meteor education, and then right down below the gray-haired, bearded gentleman who's my editor. They worked on the education angle to this story and came up with the idea of whole. And so that's where it was born. The book came out. We've already won an international award for groundbreaking work. And so when we came out of CBRE, the first thing we wanted to ask the question, how many of you have some kind of wellness program in your schools? Okay. You're not going to like what I'm going to tell you over the next 10 or 15 minutes, but that's okay. There's, there's hope at the end of this tunnel. So the first question as a researcher is, what is the problem that wellness programs are designed to solve? That was the first question we asked. Makes sense, right? I meet with Dr. Roizen. He's the chief wellness officer for the Cleveland Clinic. How many have heard of the Cleveland Clinic? And he's a character. Dr. Oz Mehmet is kind of a colleague in crime. He's written 18 best-selling books. Uh, he created an assessment that I recommend everybody take called the Real Age Assessment. It measures your chronological age against your biological age. He is 74 years old chronologically. He's 55 years old biologically. So I talked to Dr. Royce, and then I had to come back twice because after the first meeting, I was so disturbed by what I heard, I had to digest it. And of course, I recorded the whole thing because it was doctor speak for seven hours. Uh, so I had to look up some words and go back and 
you know, understand log, logarithms and uh, regression analysis and regression to the mean and all of this type of stuff. But I came back and um, we have a true existential threat to our country. We may think it's in Washington, D.C., we may think it's in the Middle East, but it's right here in this room. So here's what happened. In 1984, our country reached a tipping point in health. In 1984, we began consuming 400 more calories per day per person. Now, what does that mean? That means about a pound and a half a year we add to our bodies. I ran into that. I'm 64 this week. So when I was in my 30s, I looked up and I was, you know, I had gained at least a pound and a half per year since I graduated. And I was a hefty 185 pounds in my 30s. <clears throat> now, uh, I'm also a... Uh, certified tennis professional, and I said, this is not going to stand. Uh, so I started getting to work. But that's the average. And so the, the consequence is that 70% of our population is either overweight or obese. 20% of the kids going to your schools are either overweight or obese. By the end of college, it'll be 40%. So what does that mean? Well, that means that being overweight or obese is a new norm in America. 50% of our population has some form of chronic disease. It's rising at a 7% compounded rate. It's been rising since the 1970s at somewhere between 5 to 10% compounded year after year. So 7% compounded over 10 years, what does that equate to approximately? It doubles. 80% of our health costs are driven by chronic disease. Health costs in America comprise 1.8, 18% of our GDP, or about $3.4 trillion. So if it doubles, we're at $7 trillion, approximately 32 to 36% of GDP. It's game over as a country, economy-wise, social disruption. We're already beginning to see kind of the, the civic uh, order being disrupted because of health issues, mental health issues, opioid crisis, access to health care. We're just beginning go going down that road. So with no slowdown in sight, wellness programs are designed to try to reduce these key behaviors. There's four key behaviors that lead to chronic disease. It is smoking, abuse of drugs or alcohol, sitting and binge watching, sedentary lifestyle, eating too much of the wrong kind of food. So all of the great experts in the world said, if we can just reduce this, then we can reduce the cost. And here's what we found. <clears throat> it doesn't work that way. Because all of the efforts for the last 70 years to try to reduce this behavior hasn't worked at all, hasn't done a thing. So our research started moving into how do we shift behavior and what we have to address and deal with is that the programs that give you the information, how many of your wellness programs tell you that this stuff is bad for you? Okay, so it's not that we don't know it's bad for us. How many of these programs give you an incentive if you kind of take some more steps? Okay, none of that works. It doesn't work. All the data, we looked at the data, we looked at the research. Wellness is a four point trillion dollar industry. So this gentleman is Dr. Ahmed Sud. We met him at the Mayo Clinic. And Dr. Sud sent us on a whole new journey. What he basically said is that stress is the, is the real killer. You know, in the workplace, employees report that work is the number one source of high or very high stress. 78% of work, workplace say that. So we started pursuing Maybe we've got the cart before the horse. Maybe it's well-being and happiness is first. And then wellness, the steps and all that, maybe that's the secondary. So stress is the killer. And in the book, we outline to what extent. There's the Whitehall study in England. We looked at baboon studies. I mean, we looked at all the different areas. And stress is the, really the number one cause of inflammation in the body. Well, we'll go through what stress does to you. So first of all, stress is the thing that gets your body moving. So it's not that we don't 
need stress or we don't want stress. There's a difference between healthy stress and unhealthy stress. So the first thing it does is it raises your blood pressure and it gets your heartbeat, rate, heartbeat going. The second thing it does is it tells your body, I need energy. So your sugar levels, it starts sending energy into, the, into the, your systems. The third thing it does is it reduces the immune system. It creates inflammation, lowers your body's ability to fight off disease. How many have ever been involved in some kind of intense project or some effort and then at the end of it you got sick the next day or, or the next week? That's because you've been on. So part of what happens now is that your body is being triggered. So this is the fight or flight. When we were, when, when we were earlier in our life, we had threats were short threats, contained threats, fight or flight. And that fight or flight burnt up all of this jet fuel that gets inserted into the system and it's on and it's off. How many have dogs in, in their house? What do they do most of the time? Sleep. And then when the UPS driver comes within a hundred yards, I have no, we've got three dogs, I have no idea how they know that it's the UPS driver and they're a hundred yards away, but they go into DEFCON 4, you know, big alert, save the house, all of that. Uh, and so they jump to action, and then they wait, and they want to know my appreciation for them saving us once again. And I say, girls, I don't know how you do it, but you keep us safe every single day. I am so grateful. And then what do they do after they, they wag their tails and they get rewarded? What do they do? That's how our bodies are designed. Rest and recovery. But what happens is... We have this thing called an imagination. And so you have a bad encounter, or somebody says something to you. How many have ever replayed what somebody said to you over and over, okay? How many have come up with some of the most brilliant responses after the fact? Yeah. I had somebody last week give me feedback. <laughs> and he did it in such a cunning way. He asked me about my business and things, and, you know, I'm just feeling like, boy, this guy really cares for me. And then, boom, that left-handed whack in the head. And I said, well, man, I, I, I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, and then I get in the car, and I start thinking about, who is this guy anyway? <laughs> what does he know? <laughs> but then I go back and, you know, you talk to God and say, okay, God, what am I supposed to get out of this? Because this, you know, whatever it is. But that activity keeps your sympathetic nervous system on. So we don't actually recover. How many have ever worked at your desk before? Eating, eating, you know, eat lunch, work. Okay. That's not rest or recovery. Recovery is four things. And you'll have to excuse me because one of them is a very intimate activity which you already know what it is, but that's one of the recovery mechanisms. Uh, food, sleep is the number one. Dogs, for whatever reason, is in that category. But they, what they do is they lower your heart rate, they get you to calm down, and that gets you into recovery mode. And so when you sleep, the lower your heart rate, resting heart rate gets, and the cooler your body temperature gets, gives that parasympathetic nervous system, that deep sleep, the ability to restore and recover. So let's pause for a minute with your table. And I want you to talk at your table and talk and just share what time you typically go to bed and what time you typically get up in the morning. Okay? Okay. Who goes to bed around 11 o'clock at night? Okay. Raise your hands. Okay. Okay. Who gets up about 5 in the morning, 6 in the morning? Okay, several. Now, who both goes to bed at 11 o'clock at night and gets up around 5 in the morning? Okay? You're legally drunk. Seriously. Your brain functioning 
is the equivalency of being legally drunk. Cummins Diesel sees that as a safety issue and you cannot operate heavy equipment if you've had less than five hours of quality sleep. Now, that may be the time you're in bed, but that really isn't measure whether you're getting sleep again. And that takes another kind of measurement device to do that. So that is the number one area of mental health. Your first number one goal of mental health is improved sleep. How many saw Bill's prison? So his company, they're so committed on this health journey, their whole leadership team made a commitment that sleep was going to be the number one professional development skill they were going to work on this whole year. They're all on a device, a sports device. This is called a Whoop. I'll tell you more about it later. And I monitor it. I have a dashboard with everybody's sleep, strain level, how much load they're carrying throughout the day, how well they're recovering, their resting heart rate, their average heart rate. I'm watching all that. Uh, and what I'm seeing is it's getting better. Sleep is up. The average amount of good sleep for that team has gone from about six hours to seven hours and 15 minutes overall. And not because we're man, it's just awareness and feedback and connecting what a good day. Most of us operate in such a suboptimal range, we don't know what it feels like to feel fully recovered and rested. Jeffrey Pfeffer, Stanford professor, real character, curmudgeon extraordinaire. I think he's on the spectrum. Um, and I can say that because my daughter's on the spectrum. So he, he has no filters, which is great. I've recorded it. Uh, most of it I couldn't play, but it's really good stuff. Work has now become the fifth leading cause of death. Heart attacks go up 20% on Mondays. Your relationship with your boss has more effect on your health than your doctor. So here's what we found. The reason wellness programs don't work is they do not deal with root cause and they do not deal with human nature. The root cause is stress. What are the coping behaviors for stress? Right. That was a huge aha for us. Tracing it back and saying, oh my goodness, it's stress. And so how do we work? And that's what the rest of the book, The Healthy Workplace Nudge. What are the alternative strategies to begin to improve and reduce the stress in the workplace? The other thing which I will not get into today is the power of behavioral economics or nudges. Dr. Richard Thaler won the Nobel Prize for Economics in 2017. It works like this. Traditional economics assumes you're rational decision makers, okay? How many feel that, for the most part, I'm pretty rational in my decision making? Okay, most of us. How many of you have kids? All right. So what traditional economics would say is that if you give your children the right information and the proper incentive, they will make the right choices or the better choices, okay? How many of you have given your kids the right information? How many have used positive incentives? How many have used negative incentives? How many have used both? How many eventually bribed them? <laughs> All right. So that's the point. Humans are irrational. But the magic is they're predictably irrational. So we can design what we call choice architecture. And choice architecture is basically, if you've got two choices, you make one more appealing than the other or one harder than the other. So in a built environment, what that would mean is you make the salad bar out and ready all day long in the cafeteria, well displayed. You make the dessert a little harder to get to. Or you put a mirror next to the vending machine. So when somebody comes up, they have to look at themselves before they buy something in the vending machine. It's a nudge. Okay? So there's all kinds of nudges. There's policy nudges, there's environmental nudges, and that was kind of the breakthrough from us, is taking it from policy into design and environment. So if stress is root cause, then human nature is predictably irrational. We need to take that into consideration. And that's why traditional wellness programs don't work. So I want to walk you through, or take you into the big aha where we shifted all of our research into this teacher thing. 
This is a uh, leadership academy I attended at Next Jump. Next Jump is an e-commerce company in New York City. They donate a lot of their time to helping support cause-oriented uh, efforts like education. Their culture and training is so unique and interesting, they basically teach it in a three-day workshop or expose you to it in a three-day workshop. It's called a deliberately developmental company. I wrote about it in the Healthy Workplace Nudge. When I heard they were doing the Academy on Education, I said, hey, I'd like to come. So I attended as a bystander, uh, and they're a company of about 250 employees. They generate $2.5 billion in revenue. To give you perspective, Google generates $1.9 uh, million dollars per employee. Next Jump generates about ten million dollars per employee. So they have a lot of money to play with. Um, so I'm going to show you this recap of what we went to and then unpack what we saw and the huge paradigm shift that led us into the research we're doing today. Okay, you saw some healthy things going on there, right? Health and wellness, well-being is very important. You saw us doing, teaching us how to take power naps. That was a fun part. Did you see doing this kind of exercise, standing with your eyes closed? Did you see the walking? And what you didn't see was the blood pressure assessment. So they did some biometrics on everybody before at the very front end. On the third day, Charlie Kim the, um, the founder of the company uh, said, we would like to take you off agenda. And he said, I think we screwed up. He said, we brought you in here and we've shown you all these wonderful things, things you could never do or never have access to. And we're wondering if what happened is we strutted our stuff and we missed what you really needed. And then they got into the results of the biometric tests. One of them was a blood pressure assessment where you lay down, take your blood pressure, and then stand up and take your blood pressure. So if you're healthy, resilient, recovered, your heart rate should go up and your blood pressure should go up because of gravity. Lay down, stand up, gravity, pump harder. If you're not, your heart functions like my 1976 Honda Civic in the winter time. Because when I would step on the gas pedal, would it accelerate? No, it would and then accelerate. And that's what happens if you're fatigued or tired. When you need to respond, there's a delay because you're, you're not resilient. So it takes a while to get it moving. But then also, it takes a while to wind down once you get the heart rate up. It takes a long time for you to catch your breath, for, you to, for the heart to wind down. There is a factor called heart rate variability, HRV. It's a new metric that sports has been using for several years that's now coming in. It's what we're using to, to measure resiliency. And heart rate variability is what's happening to your heart in between the beats. And what's happening is it's fluttering like, a, like a, a, a car engine idling. You know, you've revved it up, you've revved it up. You know, it moves up and down. 
So it's the difference if you're, if you're really resilient, you have high variability. All that means is that when you need to turn it on, you can turn it on quick, and when, you, when you're ready to turn it off, it turns off quick. They first started using this decades ago to look at infant mortality, and they found the relationship between children that died in the hospital had very low heart rate variability. So you can think of flatlining as having zero variability. And then there's a stress test. You saw them walking. That's called an optigate. And what it's measuring is how much load you're putting on the ground and the cadence of your step and the balance. Depending on how you're dealing with stress, your body will, it's kind of like being out of align, having your car out of alignment. It'll pull one way or the other depending on the stress load you're, you're experiencing. And then there's this test here. I'm, need to be careful, you know, standing up on one foot with your eyes closed. And then, how long can you do that? So, they took all these three and they came in and said, out of 20 people, this is the lowest rated group we've ever dealt with. All of you are in survival mode times a thousand, they said. You're in survival mode times a thousand. So I'm listening to the data, watching that, but I'm watching the teachers because I'm not part of the, I'm, I'm an observer. What I'm watching is heads dropping, shoulders dropping, exhaling, and then the story starts. The life stories. And someone said, so I'm not supposed to feel like this every day. And then, the way my brain works, we've been doing all this engagement work. And I said, oh my goodness, what if it's not engagement? What if that's not the problem? What if it's battle fatigue, weariness, depression, stress fatigue? And he described it as there's kind of two rungs. There's you care for others, you care for yourself. And he said that the business world is good about caring for themselves, not very good about caring for others. He said, but as teachers, your job is to care for others. So I called it the caregiver's dilemma. It's not that teachers don't care. The, the disengagement numbers are basically telling people who look at them that we need to get teachers to care more, get them engaged. It's not the problem. We've been trying to solve the wrong problem for four decades. We've been sending people into the battle lines, and the battle has changed. So I want to talk about why the battle has changed and why we need to rethink what is a school because the current model of what is a school is leaving behind collateral damage in the form of good teachers and especially in the Christian context faith-based schools because you get paid less and you're expected to do more and it's part of your mission and I'm here to tell you this that a worn out teacher is no good to their class as much as they want to and I have gone around the country and begun I began asking who's taking care of the teachers what program do you have that helps teach resiliency recovery what kind of care do you have for secondary trauma, vicarious trauma going on? Guess how many schools I found doing something systemically, consistently for their teachers. Guess how many schools I found? Zero. I've been looking for two years. Now there's a lot for the kids. Trauma-informed care. We do a lot of training for teachers to help kids dealing with their issues. Social-emotional literacy counselors, nothing for teachers. So we can't win the battle if we're sending in wounded warriors with 60-pound back, backpacks with all the stuff they have to do. So one of the things in terms of stress is created, there's a matrix and it has, it has two axes. Cognitive load, high or low, autonomy or agency, high or low. Creative stress, what I'm doing now, high cognitive load, right? I've got to deliver the goods. But I have a lot of discretion and autonomy and creativity in how I do it. It's positive stress, right? Teachers more and more are being handcuffed. So they have to deliver certain things 
and being constrained, and they have high cognitive load because of all the little kids they have to deal with and the schedules and the programs and things like that, and they're getting less and less autonomy. Think of a call center. High cognitive load, you don't know who's calling in, got to go through a script, one of the highest burnout areas. This was our first mind shift effort in Dallas. And here we were trying to get to what is the problem. That's usually their first summit is what's the problem? What's behind the wicked problem? And John O was one of the counselors there. And it's interesting how many former teachers we found that are still part of education. They're just not teachers anymore. Marilyn, who's in there, went back to her doctor eight months after she stopped teaching. And her doctor asked, what are you doing differently? Your blood work is great. You don't have high stress anymore. And she was thinking, she said, well, I quit teaching eight months ago. That was the only change. No change in diet or exercise was the only change. John O, five years as a teacher, and five years tends to be kind of a make or break uh, time frame for teachers. His routine was this, public school, but he had to be there early in the morning because one of his students... Her parents left early and so left her alone, so she had to go someplace, so they dropped her off at school. An hour before school actually started. Then he had to stay late at night because one of the other kids, if they went home, it might not be a positive situation for them. They may get beat up. So he's carrying that load. Then he started finding, I wasn't dealing with it well. Now, this is a believer. He says, I was drinking too much, I was gaining too much weight, and he said this phrase, he said, when I discovered that I was giving out of my essence and not out of my abundance, I knew I had to get out. Does that hurt you like it hurts me to hear that? And then the survivor's guilt, Mrs. B in Colorado, you know, feeling the guilt of leaving the kids behind and the parents, but they have to do it for their own health. So I've got a graphic scribe, and you can see what we captured in that first session that we were in. And then we went to Los Angeles, because what we wanted to see is what do teachers do for self-care that are in the front lines. This is in South Central LA. It's not a place you want to be at night. This is in a wraparound services organization called A Place Called Home, and they house a school for homeless called RISE. So we spent a day there. Uh, got to know some of the kids and the teachers. They do amazing work. And uh, we'll talk about 50% of their kids graduate and go to college. Um, and it's interesting. They don't focus on academics. What we saw here, how many remember the uh, taxonomy, the left behind schools, the well-schooled, poorly educated, we started seeing a correlation between strategies. And so if you're in a left-behind school, the strategy is the bottom two rungs of Maslow's hierarchy. So they made sure the kids had clothes, that they had a place to sleep, that they had food. They helped them learn how to navigate the system for their parents who may not speak English in terms of driver's license, getting a job. They did all these fundamental things, and that provided enough stability for 50% of those kids to graduate and go to college. And we never heard how great their calculus program was or their STEM pro. We didn't hear any of that. We just heard them talking about care. So it's a different kind of equipping. Then uh, I was in New York City and Phil Williams, the guy next to me, he's with Delos. Delos is the organization that started the Well Building Standard. And we took several kids from an organization called Public Colors. And Public Colors is, is a youth-driven area to paint the schools that look like prisons, but they make them fun and creative, and they really try to create a good environment, but it's more about community engagement. You know, the artifact is the school, but it's the kids working and learning how to work together. It's, it's an amazing organization. Uh, and so we expose these kids to what it could be like out there, what, what the opportunities are for them. And then James and Deborah Fallows, you know the book, Our Towns. I think it's a groundbreaking strategy for any church that wants to make a difference in their community. They traveled to 30 communities around the country that were thriving. And these are what you might call secondary markets, like Sioux Falls, 
Columbus, Ohio, Spartanburg. They found that there were 10 attributes that these communities have that, that helped them revive after the 2008 economic crash and make, turn them into thriving communities. And education is part of all of those sectors. They covered Holland, Michigan. So we said, we're going to have a summit in Holland, Michigan. So we helped arrange a time for us. We visited five of the schools, and we wanted to see what good civic health looks like, good stakeholder engagement looks like. And so we explored the conversation through that lens. Here we are in Holland, Michigan. Notice we're dressed warmly, but this is an outdoor school, preschool, called uh, Little Hawks. So we saw a little bit of what they were doing there in terms of outdoor education. We went to Holland High School, to Hamilton School District, to Black River, and to Holland Christian. And then we had brought them all together for our book barn raising summit. We brought in a Disney producer, a colleague of mine. So you have to come to one of our summits. They're incredible experiences. And the Disney producer helped us learn how do we turn research into storytelling. And so it's a collective effort. So he worked with us on, on that part of the process. And then we went to work. And you can see that we have a student voice in our summits. And this is a group from Hamilton. And they're, they're sharing the book cover. So one of the exercises was coming up with a book cover. And we had some incredible book covers that were done. But they're oftentimes... It's not the book cover itself, it's the conversation, it's the ideas behind the book cover that give us a little clue as to the nuggets of truth they're finding. And in their book cover, they had the passion code. They also talked about, in the book, there'd be these QR codes, and the QR codes would bring up things. We thought, wow, what a different mindset, that this would be an interactive book with QR codes and all of that. We probably won't go down that road. Uh, I'm still enough of a digital immigrant to say, okay... That's more than what I want to bite off. But what we did do is we invited this class into writing a chapter. And they're going to write a chapter on what does stress look like through a student lens in the day in the life of a student. And the school that they represent is a rural school. Hamilton is kind of an exurb from Holland. And they have, uh, they have millionaire families and people that have propane in their backyard and need food help. So they have a wide variety and they have a very, um, very mosaic ethnic look. So they're going to pick kids and, and talk about what does stress look like in the day in the life and how, would, how could it be better. So they're going to write a future narrative in that. This looks familiar because it looks like the whole, but one of the book's covers was Dying to Teach. Uh, we thought, wow, that's an interesting provocative title, Dying to Teach. has kind of double meaning behind it. It may be a chapter title, but I doubt if it'll be the book title. And then you can see Whole, which led the whole thing off. This is what our book barn raising looks like. We collect all of the big ideas, the conversations, the topics, the quotes, the data, the research, and we put them in analog cards. We create a deck of about 200 cards, give those cards to a group and say, build your own book out of it. You, don't have, you can use all the cards, none of the cards, make up your own cards, but here's a starting point. So they create headers and you can see how they're organizing the work, creating that. This is the student group working on it. And then we have a report out. Everybody shares their book and their content and we capture all of that data. And we come back when we start writing the book, when I start writing the book, all of that, I go hide away for about six months and synthesize and go through all this and try to figure out what that common thread is. So the research is truly collective research and shared, and it was very passionate to see people get involved. Too much of the research that's out there is one person detached. This is, <laughs> this is very engaged, passionate research about things people care about, and they get involved in it. And you saw a little bit of the feeling of it this morning, creating your Pixar storyline and going through that. And just imagine going through that iteration process over and over again until it comes crystal clear and you can create an actual prototype out of that. So what do we have coming up? Unfortunately, most of you... Cannot make Dallas next week, but we have our final summit next week in Dallas. And it really is diving into some interesting turf. 
On the far right-hand side is Dr. Gasco. He's the Dean of Education for the University of North Texas South Dallas campus. They have a very unique training program for teachers because they're taking into consideration the new war and the new world of teaching. They're teaching mind, body, spirit, wholeness for teachers. Because they recognize that you bring who you are and if you're going into the war zone, you have to have resiliency. And if you've got things in your life that aren't worked on and if you go into a high stakes, high stress environment and kids get triggered and you get triggered and before you know it, you're re-experiencing the trauma that you never dealt with in the past. Wow. <laughs> how, many, how many went to school and got that kind of training in your teaching? It's really the first cadre of a new kind of teacher warrior coming into the, into the world. <clears throat> because whether we like it or not, the world has changed dramatically since I graduated. Then, Will Ritchie, how many have ever brought Will Ritchie in with Journeyman Inc. or Diverse Lounge? They deal with abused and at-risk kids, and they take them through a transformation process through storytelling. And these kids will go to a performance, and that's why we scheduled it for next week, because they have one of their quarterly performances. Uh, these kids who come in, shame, anger, bitterness, don't want to talk to anybody, and they first start out with a very simple, low-risk, high-value exercise, and it's a template. So that Pixar exercise, which was a template, they basically do that for your life story. And so they have them first get comfortable with telling it, sharing it in a safe way where everybody's on the same playing field. Then they have them get comfortable with telling the reality, the harsh reality of their story. And then they learn how to embrace that as part of who they are instead of separating that story. And then they share and show them how to take strength out of that story. And then how to write that story down. And to write it well and then put it in spoken word and tell it well and then get up in front of 400 people and perform. And what happens through that two to three year process of going through that they're different because they have a different story. They have agency. They have purpose. They found meaning. It's powerful. And then Michael Lagaki is my scribe. And then another part of this too is how many have ever heard of Karen Blesson? She's the only Pulitzer Prize winning graphic artist. Dallas Morning News. And what Dr. Gasco said is we need to change the narrative and, and the picture and the face of teachers. We need a new narrative. How many have seen the Time magazine covers of the, you know, I'm a teacher in America. I'm working two jobs, I'm doing Uber, I'm selling blood. So Karen Blesson, the black ones on the side are different images and portraits of who a teacher really is, who they are. They're warriors, they're graceful, they're poets, they're caring. So that's part of the narrative too, is, is how do we shift the image and the narrative of the worn out, tired teacher and start portraying the image of resilient, bold, courageous, healthy teachers that are going into tough situations in war zones, well-equipped though. What does well-equipped look like? We've got the Momentous Institute coming in and Michelle Kinder, the executive director. They're a 95-year social wraparound services, emotional health clinic in South Dallas, but they also have a lab school. They teach these kids at an early age about brain health and how to manage stress and emotional strain and how to manage what they call an amygdala hijack. That glitter ball there is one of the things they do. So when a child is having an amygdala hijack, they don't try to reason them down. They give them the ball and there's a little circle to go sit in and they just do some breathing. They shake up the ball and they breathe in and out until it resets the vagal nerve. And then that emotion is 
drain and, and you've engaged the parasympathetic nervous system and re-engaged them. These kids at three years old know how to do that. I work with executives that don't know how to do this. And they'll throw their temper tantrum in front of everybody. <clears throat> and I just want to give them a glitter ball and say, breathe. And they're finding that these kids, even though it goes through fifth grade, 80% graduate high school and go to college, even after fifth grade. And we're finding that our best spent dollars are early childhood dollars. Raj Chetty with Harvard has a great study looking at the value, the latency effect of the, the, the benefits of early childhood education. And it may not show up in test scores in schools, but it does show up later in life. We're bringing in Dr. Jay Faber, brain scans, because we're going to look at what does chronic stress and trauma do to the brain, and what can you do, and what do we need to know in terms of brain health. I actually had my whole family scanned this summer for our summer vacation. <laughs> so when, when they asked, what did you do on your summer vacation? We went and had our brain scanned. And it was very valuable for us. But this is some of the new science coming because what's happening with stress and fatigue and all that, it's affecting the brain. If you're not getting good deep sleep at night, your brain's not getting cleansed every night, you're susceptible to other kinds of health conditions and later, like dementia and stuff like that, which none of us want to want to experience. We're also bringing in the youth theater called Cry Havoc. They did a play called Babel. And this youth theater did, spent a year doing research on gun violence. And they went to Sandy Hook and they went to the NRA conference and they wanted to research for themselves where it was and they put the stories into a play. So we're bringing the kids in to, to say, well, what was the trigger? What did you learn? What changed your mind? Where are you at? If you were going to advise it in school, advise a school, what is your strategy for gun violence? What would it be? Uh, because we're finding too many schools are taking the fear route and bunkering down. And we think we need to have a broader discussion about that. Diverse Lounge, we're going to experience that Friday night. So let me talk about the teacher athlete a little bit. So there's four kind of new themes that came out of all this research. One is we need to think about the teacher the way sports treats uh, high-performance athletes. And that is the conditioning, the recovery, and recognizing that our energy, that we manage our energy, not our time. We know schools where teachers don't even get bathroom breaks where the lounges are the most dank, I don't want to even say functional places, but they're not area, there's no place to recover. There's no permission to recover. There's no understanding of what recovery is like. Next Jump, for example, one of their mental health uh, practices is they have what they call talking partners, TPs. And they'll match people up based on a certain grid they have. Either you're you're on the confidence spectrum, which goes to arrogance under pressure, or you're on the humble spectrum, which goes to insecurity under pressure, and they'll pair you with your opposite. And the first thing every morning is you come in and you process a bit. Bad commute, tough night, boss chewed you out, and you'll, somebody will help you just process and listen to what's going on, and then give you kind of a different lens on how to do it. If you're kind of humble, to uh, insecure and, and something was unfair, that person will say, I think you need to say something about that. And if you don't, I'll be right behind you making sure you do. But what they found is it's brain science because if, if your mind, if your cognitive load is thinking about this stuff, you can't be your best at work. It's not touchy-feely stuff. This is brain science in terms of cognitive load. Your brain can only handle so much cognitive load, and when it is, you're just in routine, you're in disengagement mode, you're going through the motions because of all the load that's on your brain. And so we have technology like this whoop band 
we want to get the data back on what teachers are experiencing in terms of load and strain and recovery and sleep. The next metaphor is the field hospital. We're going to move into a narrative of reimagining what a school is as the new field hospitals for America. And we're not just an, a content delivery system or a college delivery system. We're the center of healing and health in our communities. And if we don't raise a generation that's healthy and happy and can navigate, that's our future. We have the most stressed out, high anxiety generation in history. How many have seen the numbers? Right. And they're coming out of our schools. We know they're coming out of their parents' homes, and that's part of it. So the next metaphor is revillaging our schools. This is Bulldog Tech up in San Jose. It's a school within a school. It's a new tech school. But it's really how do we revillage or humanize the schools, but not just the school, but the stakeholders, the parents, and make them part of this is this is a village that we're creating, and it's a village feel. And we can see in the, the book Our Towns, that's where the concept came from, that book Our Towns, is noticing that what these communities did is they reconnected on a civic level, and the civic institutions became integral to their being intersections of social capital. We've got to rebuild the social capital, of starting with our schools and expanding out into the community. It's another key theme that we think is important. So, with the few minutes we have left, I want you to think about what excites you about today. And I want you to talk on your table, and I want you to process these questions at your table. I think for us, one of the first steps to wellness is embracing the beauty in our brokenness and highlighting the lines that have glued together our pieces, the stories that brought those together, and making it safe to come to school and not have to perform and not have to pretend and not have to fake it, but to begin with what you got and begin putting the mosaic together. This Japanese art form is transforming. It's a powerful message. It's part of who we are. And I believe that for us to get moving forward, all of the stuff, the noise, the, tri the, the tips and the suggestions we have are important. But getting to the essence and the core of wholeness and the reality of brokenness, bringing those together and having school as being that kind of artistic way that it gets woven together into a community, revillaged. To me, that's the hope. That's the exciting thing. And it's liberating, too, for me. It takes a lot of the pressure off of all of the other stuff and the noise, because if we get this part right, the other stuff will follow. Thank you very much.